I'm, I'm uh, Victor Vieux, uh, engineer on the on the Swarm product, and today we're going to talk about Swarm. So, what is Swarm? Uh, Swarm is basically a simple way to run uh, multiple containers on multiple hosts and uh, using the like the Docker native way. You don't need an external tool. You don't need to to learn new tools or new CI. It's it's uh, everything uh, like in the everything from Docker. So just uh, Let's have a small example. Uh, today, if you don't have used Docker Swarm and you want to start multiple containers on uh, multiple machines, what you usually do is you take your CLI uh, with dash H, you use IP and port of the first machine, you start a few containers, and then you change uh, in dash H IP and port, and you put the second machine, start containers, and so on and so on. It's it's really a pain to maintain because you have to remember on which container is uh, on sorry on which node is which container. That is really a, a maintenance uh, burden. Uh, if you use Swarm, you basically have the Swarm manager that is going to connect to every node. It's going to manage your cluster for you. And what you do is you just use uh, the Docker CLI and you talk to Swarm, and, and that's it. You don't have to worry about uh, where your machines are. You just talk to Swarm, and Swarm is going to figure out, uh, I don't know, where to where to place your containers for you or, or stuff like that. So here. Uh, as it's uh, shown in the in the schema, it's uh, the Docker CLI. So once again, you don't have to learn new tools. Uh, if you know how to do a Docker run, a Docker pause, a Docker stop, what you name it, uh, you you basically already know how to use Swarm because it's the exact same commands. So Swarm in a nutshell uh, takes multiple Docker engines and creates a virtual engine, and you just issue your commands to this virtual engine using the same uh, API. It's very easy to get started. We're going to talk about this in a minute. And uh, you can swap components uh, from Swarm to use your own. Let's talk about setup first. Uh, you have uh, basically two ways to do the setup uh, in, in Swarm, two main categories. There is one category where uh, you are using uh, the whole new networking model that was introduced in, uh, I think, the previous release of Docker. And you have uh, a simplest way when, when you don't want to use networking. So I'm going to start uh, without the networking. It's uh, very, very easy to test Swarm uh, if you don't want to use it in production for now, just for testing. It's super simple. You do Swarm create. This is basically going to give you a, a unique token generated. Then on every machine uh, where you want to join your your cluster, you do swarm join, you set the IP and port of the engine and the token. This is basically just going to the hub and it's going to associate this IP and port with this token. And after that, you can start the manager by just giving him the, to the token, so it's the last line. And this line is basically going to the hub, getting the list of IP and ports, and that's it. After of course, every communication is uh, between the manager and the node. We don't go to the hub each time, but here the, the token stuff is just here as a bootstrap mechanism, so you don't need any infrastructure in your in your in your in your project uh, besides Swarm to to try it. Um, yeah, to evaluate Swarm, it's really really simple. If you want to use it in production, it's going to be kind of the same, but instead of using this token, so instead of using the hub, you are going to use your own KV store. So here the example says console, but it can be etcd or zookeeper. And basically the same thing on every node you want to join your cluster, you do swarm join, you put IP and port of the engine, and you, you say, okay, let's let's advertise this IP and port into my con my own console. And then for the manager, uh, exactly the same, but again, instead of giving a token, you give uh, your own console. And also, just if you have a really small set of, of nodes that are never changing, you can uh, just create a text file if you want, and you can say "swarm manage" and give the text file. So here it's a few ways to to use Swarm uh, if if you don't if you don't need the new the new networking model. And now let's see the setup with the networking model. Uh, so I'm going to use this setup in all the demos and and stuff. Uh, so. For those who are familiar or who are not familiar with the new networking model, basically since Docker, I believe, 1.8 or 1.9, you can create overlay networks and you can add containers to those networks and, and they're going to have a private IP. So 
basically two containers can talk to each other even if they're not on the same machine. And it's really seamless and it's fully integrated to Docker. And to do that, when you start your Docker daemon, you have to give two flags, which are cluster advertise and cluster store. And as you can see, it's very similar to Swarm join. And basically, if you do that in the Docker daemon, you, you don't actually need the Swarm join anymore. You can just do Swarm manage um, and, and you, you give uh, this option. So basically, if you already have a Docker configured and if you already have a network uh, configured, using Swarm is just one line. It's just Swarm manage and you give the same console or the same KV store you used for the networking and, and that's it. It's going to work um, out of the box. So let's talk a bit about the internals. Uh, Swarm supports resource management, and once again, we really uh, aim for simplicity, and if you know how to use Docker, you will know how to use Swarm. So if you want to start a container, and you want this container to use one gig of RAM, you just do docker run m one gig, one g, and Swarm is going to, um, basically Swarm knows the list of all your nodes. He knows where there is uh, RAM available, where there is not. So if you do that, he's going to find your machine, which has one uh, gigabyte of memory available. If uh, your cluster is full or you don't have a one gig, uh, so I'm going to refuse to start the container and I send you a message like uh, not not uh, not enough resources in your cluster. Same for CPU. So if you want one CPU, Docker run dash C1. And uh, same for ports. So in, the, in Swarm, we consider everything that's unique a resource. So ports are actually uh, unique. So Basically, let's say you have uh, three machines in your cluster and uh, you want to start a, a web container, uh, Nginx or Apache. You can do docker p at column at, so it is going to export, expose, sorry, the port 80 in your container to the port 80 of the machine. So if you do this, uh, your container is going to start on one machine. If you want to run another container with the same uh, port exposed, Swarm is going to know that uh, this particular machine AT is not available on it, so let's not schedule on this machine. Pick a machine where AT is free. And of course, if all in all your machines, AT is unavailable, same, you will have a, an error saying uh, not enough resources to start this container. Now let's talk about constraints. So <clears throat> constraints, uh, it's a way to, when you schedule container, when you are doing your Docker run, it's a way to give some, um, so, so to influence the decision of the scheduler. So um, when you do a Docker info on Docker, you will see a bunch of information like uh, what is the operating system of the machine, what is the storage driver of the machine, the kernel version, all those stuff. And you can use all of that as a constraint. So here's the first example. Let's say you want to start a container and for some reason you want your container to end up on a machine where the operating system is Fedora. You just do the current dash E, constraint column, operating system, equal, equal, Fedora. And uh, yeah, basically, Swarm is going to look for all these machines and just going to scale your container on a machine which uh, has Fedora as operating system. Again, if you uh, don't have any Fedora machines, going to refuse to start. So you can use every everything that is in Docker Info. And so, so one example is with a storage driver, which you can use kernel version or, or anything. The custom constraints are, are very useful. When you start your Docker daemon, you can add labels on it. It's, uh, it has been in, in Docker for like uh, a few releases already. So here, small example, I start my daemon and I say region equal US East. So I tag this, this daemon as region equal US East. And then I can use this as a constraint. So I can say uh, start my container only on this region. And also you can pin a container to a specific node. You're using the particular node constraints. So here in this example, it's going to find a node that uh, has node two as name uh, to, to start my container. Now we have affinities. Uh, they're kind of similar, but um, they're used uh, for uh, co-scheduling, so uh, relationship between containers. Uh, let's say you want to start a web container, and uh, so you do that by just Docker and like the first, com the first example with Nginx. And then let's say you want to start a logger container and you want your logger container to be next to your web. You can use a container affinity. It's where you see dash E <coughs> affinity uh, container equal equal web. So basically this means 
put me next to a container that is named web. We also have entire affinities. Um, in this example, let's say you have uh, three machines in your cluster and you want to start a Redis, uh, a Redis that is uh, sharded across multi mesh machines. So what you're going to do is you're going to start the Redis master. So here you don't have any memory, any CPU, you have nothing. So basically Swarm is going to pick a machine randomly because there is no way it can choose uh, since there is no parameter. So your master is going to end up on a random machine. And then when you want your slave, you don't want your slave to end up on the same machine as the master. Otherwise, if the master, if the machine goes down, uh, you lose two, two redices. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So what you do is you say with this entire affinity, you say, don't put me next to a container that starts with redis. And so uh, if you start uh, a first slave, it's going to be on a machine when there is not the master machine. If you start a second slave, it's uh, going to be on, the, on your last machine. And at this point, every machine in your cluster will have a, a container that starts with redis. So if you start, if you try to start a, a third slave, it's going to say, I can't start it because all your machines already have a redis. So after it's up to you to add new machines or, or I don't know, but that's how, that's how it works. Um, and we also have image affinities. Uh, the last one, it's basically to say, uh, schedule me on a machine where the Redis image is already pulled. So it can speed up some, some uh, starting time if you don't want to wait for the image to pull. If you know that on some nodes in your cluster, Redis is already pulled, uh, you can use this uh, image affinity. And the last one uh, are soft affinities and soft constraints. So it's uh, basically what I just explained, but uh, they are soft, meaning that we're going to try to apply those constraints or those affinities, and if we can't, we're just going to discard them. So uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but let's let's look at the last example with the soft affinities. Uh, let, let's take the, the 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 example I did before. So you have three machines. You have one machine with a Redis master and two, two machines with a Redis uh, slave on it. As I told you before, if you try to start a third a Redis container, it's not going to work because uh, you have Redis everywhere. If you use a soft affinity, like uh, with the small like tilt just before Redis in the last line, it's going to try to find a machine without any Redis. But if there is no, it's going to completely discard this, this affinity and still scale the container. So you can use this. And if you use the last one, it is still going to start your third ready slave on a machine where there is already another Redis, but um, that's how that's how you use it. So, of course, you can combine uh, affinities, constraints, anti-affinities, anti-constraints, and soft in the same line. So, you can pretty much uh, influence uh, the scheduler as you want. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really flexible the way the way you you can uh, you can schedule stuff with uh, containers. I mean, with a swarm. And now let's start about talking about the scheduler. So um, the scheduler is uh, quite simple. So with your KV store, it's going to get the list of IP and ports, um, basically the list of all your machines. Then we're going to apply some filters to exclude nodes. So for example, the port filters, uh, uh, it's why I explained at the beginning with the port 80. If you want to start a container with the port 80, the port filter is going to take care of removing from the list all the machines where AT is not available. Constraints, affinity, health, uh, explanatory, dependencies, <clears throat> it's stuff like, I don't know, volumes from. If you do a volume from, you want your container to be in the same machine as the original, uh, like the other one. So this filter is going to, to take care of those. And after this first step, you get uh, basically a subset of nodes um, where it's possible to schedule. And after we apply a strategy to rank and pick the best node. So today we have uh, three strategies, bin packing, spreading, which is uh, the default one, and random. So basically bin packing, we're going to try to put as much containers as possible on one machine. So um, we leave other, comp other machines uh, empty for like bigger containers. Spreading, it's the other way around. And random, of course it's random. So for bin packing and spreading, we're using the resources first. So if you say, uh, <clears throat> I want a container with one gig of RAM, um, we're going to use this one gig information to decide which machine is the best one. If you don't specify any resource constraints, 
we are just going to use the number of containers. And basically, since spreading is the default, it means that without any configuration, if you start a container on Swarm, it's going to go on one machine. If you start another container, it's automatically going to go on another machine. So by default, it's going to evenly balance all your cluster, all your um, containers on the cluster. Uh, uh, no, let's talk quickly about what's new in the latest version. We have improved node management, rescheduling, inexperimental, and new events. Um, improved node management, you can see that when you do a Docker info on Swarm, you get much more information than on Docker. You get a list of nodes. You get um, basically here everything that is uh, uh, underlined is a new. You get the status on this node. So the first one, it's it's status is pending, it means the manager is still trying to connect to this node, but uh, didn't connect yet. The second status is unhealthy. Uh, it is for when you had a, a engine that was working correctly and, and now it's not working anymore, uh, it goes to unhealthy. You even see the error, so it's really useful. Before you didn't have all of that, so it was practically impossible to, to debug, uh, to know why your, your node was not showing up or why your, your containers disappeared, so now you know. And the last one is healthy, so you see uh, it's fine, you see there is no error, you see all these labels and everything. Uh, the other one is uh, rescheduling, so it's an experimental feature. It's going to go out of experimental in the next version, which is going to be like in a month or so. Um, so you use the experimental flag when you start farm, and, and that's it, it's enabled. And then you can apply your reschedule policy when you start your container. So it's kind of similar to the constraints and affinities uh, in the usage. It's dash E, reschedule, column, and, and your policy. Today we support only one policy, it's on node failure. So basically what it means is uh, when the node goes down, you need to restart containers. Let's take a small example. Here we have uh, three machines, two containers on the first one, one on the middle, and three containers on the right. Two containers and the last machine are not uh, on node failure enabled, and the other, the last one is off. And of course, by default, it's off. You have to enable it manually. So, if the last machine uh, goes down, there is no failure. What's going to happen is the two containers that were uh, that had the rescheduling policy are going to be rescheduled. Since I had just explained, but since uh, spread is the default strategies. Going to evenly balance your container, so that's why that's why one goes on machine one and one goes on machine two. And the last container that had a uh, rescheduled policy off or just unspecified, uh, it's just going to be lost uh, because it was not rescheduled. And the last one is a new event system. So uh, in Docker 110, they redid the whole events, uh, the whole event uh, command, and it's much better now. You can um, you can inject your own metadata. So you do a Docker event against Swarm. So you get, for example, here the first one is a container create event. But you see, Swarm added some uh, useful uh, metadata as attributes. So you have the Swarm ID of the container. You have uh, the node address, the node name. So <clears throat> it's really useful when you create a container. You directly know on which machine it's running. Uh, same for the, the second uh, event, the network connect event. Uh, you see every information added by Swarm. And the third one is even is different. This is an event generated by Swarm, so it's uh, an event that doesn't exist in, in uh, the engine. And it's when an engine connects to your cluster. So you get uh, you get events like engine connect, engine disconnect, and all those things, and you can um, <clears throat> you can react upon those. Um, all right, so uh, I think it's been 20 minutes. I'm going to uh, let uh, Jeff continue, and after, if we have time at the end, uh, I have a, a small demo that uh, we can we can look at. Thank you. I've uh, so one of the things people wanted to talk about um, was so yesterday uh, we released a new article, um, basically comparing. Swarm features and functionality at scale with Kubernetes uh, at scale. Um, and so really the article was in response to a lot of a lot of conjecture and not a lot of data around how the two platforms perform at scale. Um, and really tried to narrow down the, the, the big conversation and, and answer that amorphous question 
um, well, does this does technology X scale? Um, and so I sat down and, and tried to actually answer that and, and provide some real data and, and quantitative analysis for that. Um, and what we found, um, it, I, I, so I evaluated both platforms um, on only their common functionality because it has to be an apples to apples comparison, um, um, which in this case is the functionality provided by Swarm. Kubernetes is a complete offering. Swarm is very specifically uh, provides a cluster abstraction for Docker clusters. Um, and so that's what we're, that, that, that was kind of the scope of the analysis. Um, and so I tried to answer what's their performance at scale, how do they operate at scale, and what does it take to support them? Um, and those are really the, the three distinct areas that repeatedly come up in conversations. Um, that I've had around tech at scale. And so when we say scale, um, several other articles have been mentioned in the last year, and now Kubernetes has official support for clusters of a thousand nodes. Um, that's quite a few, um, especially for large scale server software. This is a real system. Um, and then further, uh, clusters of a thousand nodes that are uh, uh, full, meaning they're running 30 containers, each node is running 30 containers, so that's 30,000 total containers. And so we wanted to see, you know, how each Swarm and Kubernetes performed um, on container startup time, meaning how long did it take to start the 30,000th first container, um, and how long did it take to list all the containers? These are both pretty sensitive operations that we would expect to degrade as the, as the node count increases and as the container count increases. Um, and so we wanted to say, let's, let's get some real numbers. This is something that we can measure. Um, and uh, I'm also happy to, to report that both Kubernetes and Swarm operate pretty well at clusters of a thousand nodes. It takes a little bit of work to get them there, and I described that in my article, um, and I described the, the architectures and which changes you need to make um, the, the awesome thing about Swarm is that the architecture um, for a, a cluster of three is identical to the architecture for a cluster of a thousand, um, which is really a testament to, to the direct integration that the Swarm manager has with each of the Swarm nodes. Um, it relies on the key value store only for node discovery, which is a very big bonus. Um, and so... Yeah, um, so what it really came down to is that, <clears throat> so th we ran this test, and what the test looked like was building up each cluster, filling that cluster, and then uh, starting the 30,000th and first container a thousand times so that we can have this large enough sample to say, to, to understand the probabilities um, and uh, well, of, of different startup times. And so we can say that um, it, it, when the cluster is 99, right, is, is 100% full, meaning 30,000, uh, 30,000 containers, um, that we were able to start the next container 99% of the time in 860 milliseconds on Swarm. And that's really fast. Um, that means that, that, that's the time from me typing in Docker run on my machine to the Swarm manager receiving that making a scheduling decision and, and walking through the, the process as described earlier, eliminating all the nodes that, that, that can't run the container, making that scheduling decision, and then actually dispatching that container by contacting the node directly, starting the container. Um, that's really fast. Kubernetes, we can say 99% of the time, um, will, will start a container in less than uh, in, in 3.91 seconds or less. Um, so that's considerably slower. And that's not to say that it's slow, but if you have a, an interactive use case um, or a, a just-in-time container use case, the point on the article, I would far prefer uh, using Swarm. Um, the other thing that we, we tested was, list, was listing all the containers. Um, <clears throat> This is a this is a big challenge. Um, you're you're asking the SOAR manager to go off, grab, you know, compile a significant amount of data, 
Uh, where we're talking about 30,000 containers and every container has, has some kilobytes of data. And so you're end up talking about, you know, megabytes of data that it has to be collected and then shipped back to the client. Um, so it's definitely no small task. Um, in testing, we can say that on a full cluster, 99% of the time, Swarm was able to return that list in just under 20 seconds, um, which is pretty darn fast. Um, Kubernetes, on the other hand, 99% of the time took 129 seconds or less, um, which is a while. Uh, and and they, they're, there's, they have some GitHub issues around that. And, and in, in other articles that they've written or like CoreOS wrote or, or some other people, they, they talked about that challenge. Um, but really, this is a testament to, to the direct integration that the Swarm Manager has with the nodes. It's able to parallel or to, to run those requests in parallel to gather that information much more quickly than it would if you were making the request through a centralized API. Um, and so that's, that's the real high level stuff. Um, the other highlights include, I think, um, and so really like, it's important to qualify these tests, right? Neither of these clusters were using the multi-host networking facilities. They both um, were, neither of them were using um, high availability key value databases. Um, neither of them were using secure TLS communications, though both of them offer, uh, offer that. Um, and uh, all of Kubernetes authentication authorization features were disabled. Um, authentication authorization is something that that uh, that both the Docker engine and the Swarm Manager offer via uh, mutually authenticated TLS, um, which is very neat. Um, what else do we have? The lowest 10% of the time. I, I thought was very interesting as well. Um, and so the, I, I tested this at multiple stages, um, but when it was a 99% or when it was 100% full, when the clusters were 100% full, 10% of the time or it would, uh, Swarm was able to start the next container in just over half a second, 560 milliseconds, which is really fast. Um, when you compare that to, to Kubernetes, which was still two and a half seconds, um, it, it performs similarly all the way down the scale. Um, and so, yeah, um, there, there was a couple of places where Kubernetes has, has a, has a neat, um, has, has some really neat functionality. Their scheduler is designed to be able to, to push things out in parallel. Um, and we had a great story around that. Um, and you can, Swarm on the other hand is, is more of a composable tool um, where if you wanna push things out in parallel, you can call Swarm in parallel. Um, and so, you know, if, if that's functionality you need, it's functionality that you can bolt on to Swarm um, and still take advantage of its low dispatch latency. Um, so yeah, other than that, um, really the, the whole experiment took me about uh, 150 hours to, to complete. Um, I started off by building out both platforms using prescribed tools, which meant Docker Machine for Swarm and, and uh, the Kube Up scripts for Kubernetes. Um, this is all done in AWS cloud. Um, and so uh, after, after initial tests, I realized I needed to do a little bit of custom work, and so I ended up building CloudFormation templates. Um, so if anyone listening is interested in spinning up a thousand node cluster uh, in AWS in a VPC, um, or at the very least seeing what that looks like from an from a AWS resources perspective, um, check out the article and check out the GitHub repo, and all those CloudFormation templates are available. All of the AMI uh, Packer templates are available. Um, and so it, it's a great starting place for building your own cluster, um, especially at scale. All right. So uh, yeah, it's uh, two, two small demos to illustrate uh, some, some features of Swarm. So the first uh, demo, uh, it's very simple. It's to, it's to give an example about networking and Swarm and how they work together. 
So here I have just uh, three machines. Um, and uh, four machines, sorry. I have three machines with Docker installed. So I have three nodes in my cluster. And I have one machine which hosts the manager and it also hosts console. So basically, uh, let me go back a bit in the slides. Right, so when I did the setup, all the top three machines had had uh, those other options. So they are using cluster advertise and cluster store. So they are network network enabled. And then I just started the manager by using the uh, same uh, console IP and port. So, um, and yeah, I'm just going to use the CLI to talk to Swarm and, and, and uh, schedule containers. And so here at the top, uh, I'm doing, going to do a Docker info, uh, lots of information, but I'm just going to grab on nodes. And as you can see, uh, in this cluster, so I have my three nodes, and uh, they are named node one, node two, and node three, and they have uh, this IP. And after this, I'm going to create a network. So I'm doing a Docker network uh, create. I'm naming it Swarm. And since uh, I'm using Swarm by default, all the networks that are created are uh, over the networks. So if I list the networks, you see that each machine has three networks. They have a host network, they have a bridge network, and they have a known. It's uh, when you want to disable networking. And at the very last, you see the swarm network. The driver at the, on the right side uh, says overlay. It means it's uh, it's an overlay network. It's a network that uh, can work across multiple machines. So now I'm going to uh, start a container. So it's a regular Docker run. I'm just uh, adding a constraint to pin this container to uh, node one. And I'm, I am I want to say, uh, let's uh, start this container on the Swarm network I just created. And I'm naming the container C1, starting a shell. And at the bottom here, I'm doing the exact same thing, but uh, this container is going to start on uh, node two, and it's going to be named C2. Mm. And it's also on the Swarm network. Uh, just if I do uh, Docker PS, uh, you can see that uh, C2 is actually working on, uh, was actually scheduled on node 2, and C1 was actually scheduled on node 1. So the constraints uh, were applied uh, as expected. Um, and so if I, if I go back, um, you see that uh, on the top one, I can ping C2 using its name, and you see that it resolves, even though the containers are not on the same machine. And that's because they're on the overlay network, so if you do an IF config, you will see that uh, my first container here has uh, two network interfaces. And if you look at ETH0, you see that it has the IP 10.0.0.2. Uh, it's because uh, by default, the, the Swarm network I created, it's a, it's a 10.0.0 uh, network. And you see that um, the other container has an IP 10.0.0.3. So basically, every time you start a container, no matter on which machine it's running, it's going to have its own private IP on the network, and uh, if you name your container, you can even use the name. That's why at first, I was able to, from the C1 container, I was able to, to ping C2, and it was uh, working working correctly. Now let's uh, take another example, a bit more complicated. Uh, it involves uh, rescheduling. So as I was saying, you can use every, uh, every tool that is based on the Docker CLI and Docker API against Swarm. So in this example, I'm going to use a Docker Compose. Docker Compose, if you're not familiar, it's a tool where you write a YAML file where you describe your entire application, and you use, you use this Compose file to, in one command, start your entire app. And uh, I'm going to use this YAML file on top on, of Swarm, and Swarm is basically going to distribute containers um, on my machines. I don't really know on which machines they're going to, it's going to place them. But since they will be on an overlay network, um, it doesn't matter. Basically, they will be able to to talk to each other. Uh, in this in this uh, demo, I'm going to use the voting app. So uh, it's uh, it's an app we we showed at at DockerCon. Uh, you will see it's a very simple app. Uh, basically, you have one part we call the voting app. Um, it's a Python web app. When you do a vote, it's going to put it in a Redis queue and uh, we have a worker in Java that is going to like uh, get from the queue, process your vote, and put it in the Postgres database. 
And on the other side, we have a Resert app, which is also a web app, but this time, this time in Node.js, that is just connecting to the database and, and is telling the results. So yeah, of course, it's a demo app uh, with lots of components in, in many, many different, uh, um, I mean, some are in Python, some are in, in, in Node, uh, but I mean, with container, it's really easy, so. And uh, for the purpose of this demo, I did something that uh, might not be uh, like production style, but one very cool thing about the networking is you can isolate containers at the network level. So I decided in this demo that I don't want my result application, I don't want my result application to be able to mess with my Redis for some for some reason. So what I did is I created two networks, one vote network in green. It's going to start by 10.0.1.0, uh, where we have four containers. And another network just for the results. You see it starts with 10.0.2, and with the result and the Postgres. So only the Postgres database is part of the two networks, uh, but otherwise it's pretty much isolated. So uh, let's go here. Um, so if I cut the compose file, you see that it's a compose file version 2. I have a list of services. So the first one, uh, my voting app. Uh, so it's using my uh, just my demo vote image. It's exposing the port 80. So um, I don't specify that I want to run on on the container to be exposed on 80 on my host. So Docker is going to allocate a random port for me. And what I say is, uh, you can reschedule this container on not failure. So here I have the rescheduling policy. Um, you can see I have the Redis, and yeah, this this voting app is on the vote network, uh, and it can be rescheduled. Uh, Redis, same, it's on vote net, it's on the vote uh, network. And all those containers are here, and you can see at the bottom I have the network definition. So I defined uh, two networks, vote and results, and are both on on uh, overlay. So now I'm go just going to do a compose up. And it's going to create the two networks, and then it's going to create the five containers. I can do uh, Docker PS. You see all the containers are running. You see here, I even have directly with Swarm the IP and port. So if I just copy paste uh, this into a browser, I get um, the result app, and this is the voting app. So this vote app allows you to vote between cats and dogs. So if I vote for cats, Go to the result, uh, you see it votes correctly. So everything is working fine. And you can see that um, the result app is on uh, node two. Uh, the yeah, result, no, sorry, result is on node three uh, next to the worker. So at the bottom here, uh, I'm going to kill uh, node three. So it's going to stop uh, node three and since both the result app and the worker was as the rescheduling policy enabled. If I do a PS, you see that those two containers, it says up for seven seconds. It's because they were just restarted. So um, here, of course, the IP changed uh, of my result. Uh, and since uh, it's a demo, I, I didn't have a load balancer connected. So if I go here, I try to refresh. Of course, the container is down, so it doesn't work. But if I change uh, the IP and put the new one, I can still vote, everything is working. So here this demo is really here to show you that uh, the, the containers get rescheduled. We, I don't have to care on which machines are running since they are all part of the overall network. So here I can do a field and the last th things I use, uh, Compose PS, and uh, it's, it's like a Docker PS but it's formatted by Compose. So you see everything is running as expected. Um, so yeah, this demo is really to to show you that if everything is configured, is uh, over network is configured, basically you don't have free, don't really have to care on which machine your containers are running because they can be rescheduled without any problem and um, like containers can talk to each other. So yeah, I'm good for I'm good for the demo, Adam. We can we can go back to questions. Great, thanks, Victor. Well, why don't we let's ask some some questions that have been already uh, already asked in the the Q and A portion, and feel free to to type your questions in that in that panel of your uh, WebEx um, 
And let's see, I'm just going to pick one right now. So yeah, I, I can I can uh, talk about load balancing because I see uh, multiple questions about it. So um, there is a tool called Interlock, and it's the easiest way to use uh, load balancing against Swarm. It's basically a, a small tool that is going to, on one side, plug to the Docker events command. And so it's going to listen to events, and as I showed you earlier, it's going to pick up uh, a create, container create on this node, a container uh, connected to a network on this IP. And uh, on the other side, it's going to configure automatically an Nginx on Apache for you. So basically, uh, that's how you can do load balancing very easily. Um, and you don't have to outcode any IP or anything when the container gets rescheduled. Um, just interlock is going to rewrite uh, your load balancer configuration for you. So yeah, Adam, if you want to put the link of interlock that I, I for some reason I cannot type in the in the channel, but. Uh, Do you want to pick a question, Adam? Yes, sorry, I just kept myself on mute. Um, so I have Trevor asking, how come does Docker PS doesn't show the network that a container is running in? Yeah, I think it's more that just, uh, unfortunately, it's just a UI, a UX uh, issue. Uh, it's because, as you saw with the result, uh, with the DB in my, in my demo, containers can be part of tons of networks. So I don't know. I, I guess it would just be impractical to put it in PS, but uh, you can do Docker network in, inspect the name of your network, and here you will get the list of all uh, the containers that are part of a network. And if you do a Docker inspect in your container, so here you get lots of information, but from here you can find out on which container this, this uh, container, uh, sorry, on which network this container is connected. Great, thanks. Um, so we have uh, lots of great questions. It's gonna be difficult to just pick a few. Um, is it necessary to create nodes using Docker machine for making it part of a swarm cluster? No, not at all. Um, it's just an easy way uh, for demos and stuff because swarm is uh, neatly integrated in Docker machine. So basically when you do a Docker machine create, there is like a flag, a swarm flag that you can put and it's going to like join your console automatically and all that stuff. But not of course, you can just go on any cloud provider, uh, GC, AWS, like you name it. Uh, you just install swarm, you install Docker and, and, and you're good to go. You, you don't have to use machine. Great. Um, and then I think we have time for about two more questions. Um, so I, I have Titan asking, so we reschedule only when the, when the node is down, but um, also when we try to add a node? Can you just confirm that? No, so today we only have one rescheduling policy. It's when a node goes down. So um, it's basically a one-time thing. When the node is down, we pick up the event. We say, okay, this node was down. Let's scan all these containers, and if if they had the rescheduling policy, we're going to reschedule them somewhere else. But for now, that's all we have. In the future, we might have some uh, like uh, automatic uh, balancing. So you, you in the future, you might be able to put a rescheduling policy, like uh, basically saying, okay, reschedule me whenever you want. And in this case, if uh, we had uh, new machines on the cluster and we want to even evenly uh, schedule containers, we might move your containers. But I mean, not right now. Right now, it's only a node failure. So it's when a machine goes down, all the containers that we are running on this machine, particularly this machine, is going to be started somewhere else. Great. And then can you, Jorge is asking, how do you HA the Docker master? How many masters can you have to master manage multiple data center deployments? Oh, yes, that's a great question, actually. I, I forgot to talk about this part completely. So yeah, Swarm supports uh, multi-masters configuration. So uh, yeah, no, all my demos, I only had one Swarm master, but uh, you can have um, uh, any number of masters. And uh, you will never have two masters, like two primary masters, but uh, 
So basically, all the scheduling decisions are always going to be taken by one master, but if this master goes down, another master is going to be elected automatically and, and take the decision. So if you want to be HA, basically you start uh, three managers, and uh, what you can do is you can put a load balancing in front of it. So um, basically when you do your Docker run, you're, instead of putting the IP of the swarm manager, you put just a, like a host name or, or something. And, and basically that's it. As soon as a, as soon as a manager goes down, uh, another manager gets selected and can, um, can make scheduling decisions. And uh, what's also so very interesting is uh, if all your master are, well, are down, like let's say you have only one and it goes down, of course you cannot schedule new containers, but your cluster itself is fine, like uh, containers are still going to run, like no problem, and, and later on um, a manager can come back and reconstruct each state and everything. So, I mean, if you lose all your masters, your cluster is not dead. It's just impossible to schedule a new containers on it. Uh, regarding multiple data centers, um, we don't have anything in particular. So, technically, you can put, like, yeah, we did, it's not really like, we don't have anything. Uh, for that, so you could put uh, like uh, one manager per per region, but um, I, I don't think it would solve all your issues.